Our next uh, item uh, is uh, uh, on from houses to homes to health. And I just wanted to reflect that fairly recently I was looking at the original medical officer reports from 1891 to Scottish local authorities. And I was, um, I guess, slightly surprised at the extent to which um, housing featured in the advice that medical officers were giving to local authorities. Um, certainly, if you're as old as I am, you'll remember in the 60s and early 70s, a very, very heavy focus on the public health role in housing and homelessness. Um, I, I, I think a prominence that has perhaps um, diminished over the last few years, and certainly within a number of um, housing audi audiences that I, I've been speaking to, um, there's been a real welcome of um, the public health community in Scotland re-engaging around homelessness and around housing. Um, so the next presenter is Neil Hamlet from NHS Fife, who has been at the centre of much of the work to reconnect these. Thank you very much. Um, I also want to take you back a little bit in time and uh, let's start first by how many of us in the audience will be able to buy our own property. Um, the younger members of the audience here might be struggling to buy their own property. And there'll be plenty of people just outside this building that will be struggling to get a roof over their heads tonight, uh, let alone rent or buy a property. Let's go back to the year um, 1854. And a man in a beaver fur-lined top hat is struggling to take the handle off a pump at a place called Broad Street. And on the back of that, epidemiology is born and much of what is now public health practice is born. Eight years later, Edinburgh gives its first municipal medical officer of job, uh, municipal medical officer of health a job in Edinburgh, Dr. Henry Littlejohn. Following year, uh, 1880, 1863, um, William Gardner is appointed through in Glasgow. And then the year after that, 1864, a lady called Octavia Hill saw and acted on the link between housing and well-being in Victorian London and on the back of that, housing studies and housing as a profession uh, is born. And as has just been mentioned, uh, we, public health, were really linked at the hip um, housing with housing colleagues uh, in our origins. And if we jump now to um, December 2016, and the Health and Social Care Integration Programme. And we read and hear that the whole thing is predicated upon people living as long as possible at home or in a homely setting. So suddenly, the house comes back. And when we look at the health and well-being outcomes that were then produced, we can see that we should be having folk living independently and at home or in a homely setting. We're increasing quality of life and overarching, we want to reduce health inequalities within those nine uh, outcomes. So I would like to suggest that we have a history and indeed we have an evidence base that is getting ever stronger that a good house is the underpinning foundation of well-being across the life course. And that that is achieved not by public health and not by Octavia Hill and those that followed her, but by organizing the efforts of society. So it's political, it's social, and we have a part to play as being a voice in public health in that. But I would move on and say that actually it's not just the house, it's the home that underpins well-being across our life course. So yes, we do need to pay attention to the rafters and the doors and the windows and the locks, but we also need to pay attention to the relationships that are allowed to form between those living under that roof and between those walls. 
You'll remember Maslow's hierarchy. Well, forget it. That's old hat. This is the ECG of well-being or the heartbeat of health. And there are five critical blocks to it. And you'll see that at the bottom, the firm foundations of that is that rafters and relationships, when brought together in the correct way, make for a healthy lifestyle and a healthy building. Two reports that started off what I think became a bit of a sea change from about three years ago. Shelter commissioned a three-year um, programme which delivered a commission on housing and well-being in uh, May of 2015. And really, if you had to turn that into a tweet, it would be that housing done right across the population generates well-being. And then, uh, a few years later, uh, in January 2017, Emily and colleagues brought out a really helpful report written for people in housing to understand us in health and written for health people to understand our colleagues in housing. So whichever language you speak, public health speak or housing speak, you can begin to understand each other. A very, very useful document. And on the back of that, quite a number of pieces of work have stemmed. And this also, I think, is a bit of a sea change as a, 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 a publication. It came out uh, in June of this year. I was trying to get to St Kilda the day it was released. Otherwise, I would have been on my phone uh, making tweets and, and, and sending out a lot of emails. But I was kind of out of range at the time. Are any of those authors in this audience? No. If they were, we would be standing up and giving them an ovation, because I believe this is one of the most significant um, publications around injustice that we'll have seen for quite some time. So let's look inside it. And at this point, I just want to take a quick aside for another piece of work that happened a few years earlier than that, that involved myself and the head of housing having a coffee and deciding that wouldn't it be good if we could find a way to link HL1 data, that's homelessness application data by local authorities, with some of the NHS data that we've got. And lo and behold, we got it to happen with a clever um, guy called Brian Archibald, who works for ISD at the time, still does, I think. And we brought together a set of slides, which you see a couple of from down there. And I went on a bit of a free, a bit of a, a tour and got a lot of free lunches speaking about that work. And one of the places I went to where I didn't get a free lunch was Scottish government, when uh, I, I was presenting to the housing officers that produce those HL1 reports. And they said, we really like what you've done in Fife. Could it be done for Scotland? And they literally had a vote. There was a hands up and, and the, the majority won through. And so Andrew Waugh, who was then in charge of that group, went away, got the money from Scottish government, chief statistician, and three years later, he's emerged with what is a fantastic piece of work. So the message is, don't belittle yourself for what you do at your own health board. It won't be as perfect as what we're about to see, but it's caused change. So be encouraged. So here's the report called the Health and Homelessness in Scotland Report, covering 15 years of data, 1.3 million of the popul Scottish population, a very complex uh, data linkage exercise with a cohort and case control study approach. The three cohorts of which the one we are interested in is the EHC, the Ever Homeless Cohort, amounting to, as you can see, uh, 435, almost 436,000 people. They were individually matched with somebody very, very like them in, who was living in one of the most deprived cohorts uh, in Scotland or one of the least deprived um, quintiles in Scotland, as by SIMD. The data sets that were interrogated, you can see below there. And when we look at this, we see here the proportion of interactions with each of those data sets 
which are running into their millions. And you can see here that the ever homeless cohort, remember, it's a third of this 1.3 population. So it should only amount for one third, i.e. up to that red line there. So everything above that red line is saying that people in the ever homeless cohort are considerably overrepresented in those data sets. Moving on, and we look here at the different cohorts. So this is the one, the ever homeless boys and girls and we are looking at the percentages of them uh, in each of these service areas. So if we pretend for, uh, we'll, we'll look at the girls and pretend I'm a girl. In fact, we'll take my wife. Um, so I'm living in, a, in a, a nice part of town in Stirling. And so I'm sitting in here, okay? And I've, or Wendy, my wife, has got a 32% chance over that time period of uh, appearing uh, at A&E. Whereas if, uh, sorry, 32% would be at A&E. So you can see the differences between the ever homeless experience and the least deprived experience. Much, much more likely to be using the above services. Now this, I think, is probably the most important or one of the most important slides in this presentation. And I'm very surprised that the media didn't get a hold of this slide and, and put it on their front pages. Because what we're looking at here, so A&E, the data set measure, that is 2.1 million A&E attendances between the 1st of January 2011 and 31st December 2016 for the 1.3 million people in the study, okay? And then we're looking at the ratio between whether you're in the ever homeless or whether you're in the least deprived cohort, what is the ratio in terms of your risk? So we can say here that compared to the least deprived group, people who've ever been homeless were three and a half times more likely to attend uh, A&E. Three and a half times. Let's jump down to deaths. And that goes up to 5.3 times. Or if you want to put it into front page speak, that would be, uh, four, the rate would be 430% higher. 430%. Often you see things in the front page when they say 20% higher, 30% higher. Here it's 430% higher. Jump up to initial assessments at drug treatment services. The ratio is 133. You can do the maths to work out the percentage higher. And I've done it for you here. If you are prescribed opioids, then, or you can see that if you're homeless, then you are 16,800% is the difference, higher rate. Uh, than if you were in the least deprived cohort of the same age and gender. That's absolutely stunning. And it demonstrates this cliff edge of inequality that we very rarely actually get to see because we only examine to the edge of the cliff where people enter our data sets. So now let's look at uh, another uh, angle of the report that's come out and you can see here zero that is the point at which the person turns up at the housing office and says I'm homeless please give me a, a, a homelessness assessment whereupon the council has a, a duty in Scots law to provide them with temporary and then uh, settled accommodation and here you can see there's 14 different um, sets of uh, um, service usage okay and you can see what's happening both before, in the lead up, at the time when they take the step to, to, to say to themselves, I really am homeless, I need help, and what happens consequentially. Now, I'm not gonna go into all the details of all these little squiggly lines. You need to go and read the report. I want you to just get a sense of the actual size of this inequity and this use of healthcare or access of healthcare by those who are finding themselves challenged in terms of their housing. Now let's look at the girls, okay? So there's the same slide for the girls 
And let's pop back and forward. Boys, girls, boys, girls. Do you spot the difference? The girls are being punished in terms of their experience for longer, in terms of their need or their accessing of care. You can see that the AA drugs, that's an acute admission with, uh, with drug misuse. You can see it's carrying on off the side of the graph there, five months after their application. They are seriously struggling in that temporary accommodation that they've been given. Now let's move on. And in fact, in order to move on, I'll move back. So you can see here, we've been looking at these ones up here. You can see this, this group down here look almost like a flat line, don't they? Well, let's change this scale here and go to the boys, and you can see that even down in these ones that looked like they were crushed together, there is gross inequality. And you can see, again, boys, girls, boys, girls. You can see what's going on here, acute admissions and mental health and alcohol. So what we're seeing here is the power of linking data. And I hope you're as impressed as I am by what we're getting out from this linked data set. And we can start looking at root causes and consequences and interventions. But how can we ensure that the hidden populations get represented in our data linkage projects? When are we going to be able to actually get alongside uh, those who go to the winter shelters in a few months' time in our cities and, and start to ask them about their health experience? Because they may not even be appearing in this data. These are the people that did come to ask for help, and there's plenty out there that don't. So how do we go about addressing all of this? Well, the key lies in advocacy in many ways, and we do have the Fairer Scotland duty out there. If you're not aware of it, if you've not read it, then read it and start applying it and start asking questions on the basis of the requirements of that uh, duty. How does housing affect health directly, Grenfell? and in terms of strategies and policies and where we're going in terms of building for the next 40, 50 years. We have to think far ahead. And so um, Health Scotland have just literally brought out a, a briefing paper. Uh, make sure you look at it, make sure you get informed by it and act on it. Indirectly, we've looked at the cost a little bit of living. Uh, in earlier presentations, housing does affect health directly in terms of policy and economics. Health, universally, we're all born housing ready. And that's one of the reasons why housing first as a policy is really very important for us to take up in Scotland. And you will see it being talked about more and more. It is a universal thing. From the cradle to the grave, we need a home and a house. Inequalities, hopefully you've got the message already that there is gross inequalities in terms of our levels of housing quality and security. So read the Health Scotland document around that. Two quick pages just listing item after item about why it's good to have a good home and what it can lead to, not just for the individuals, but also for savings to the public system and the public service. So let's apply a public health lens and make sure that we are intelligent in our provision of health care um, by using data that underpins it. I would like to suggest, in finishing, that homelessness is a core and sensitive indicator of social injustice across Scotland, and it should be within the public health priorities in Scotland. There's been a lot happening in the last three years. We have everything in line. We have the perfect storm, the perfect wave, call it what you will. But Scotland is on the move in terms of its uh, understanding of the well-being impact of getting our housing policies and practice right in Scotland. Thank you very much. Thank you.